Okay, hello folks, and thank you for joining me for part three of the roots, roots <laughs> of ritualism in the church and masonry by H.P. Bulaski, part two, February 1920, reprinted from Lucifer, volume four, May 1889, Theosophical Publishing House, Adya Madras, India. Um, okay, part seven. Section seven, anyway. Chapter seven, or whatever. And, uh, let's start. The ritualism of primitive Christianity, as now sufficiently shown, sprang from ancient masonry. The latter was, in its turn, the offspring of the then almost dead mysteries. Of these, we now have a few words to say. It is well known that throughout antiquity, besides the popular worship composed of the dead letter forms and empty exoteric ceremonies, every nation had its secret cult known to the world as the mysteries. Strabo, one of the many, and um, one among many others, warrants for this assertion. Uh, George Lib Ten. No one received admittance into them save those prepared for it by special training. The neophytes instructed in the upper temples were initiated into the final mysteries in the crypts. These instructions were the last surviving heirlooms of the archaic wisdom, and it is under the guidance of the high initiates that they were enacted. We use the word enacted purposely. For the oral instructions at low breath were given only in the crypts, in solemn silence and secrecy. During the public classes and general teachings, the lessons in cosmo cosmogony and theogony were delivered in allegorical representation. The modus operandi of the gradual evolution of cosmos, worlds, and finally of our earth, of gods and men, all was imparted in a symbolical way. The great public performances during the festivals of the mysteries were witnessed by the masses and the personified truths worshipped by the multitudes blindly. Alone in alone, the high initiates, the epite, understood their language and real meaning. All this and so far is well known to the world of scholars. It was a common claim of all the ancient nations that the real mysteries of what is called so unphilosophically creation were divulged to the elect of our fifth race by its first dynasties of divine rulers, gods in flesh, divine incarnations, or avatars, so called. The last stanzas given from the book of Dizen, uh, or Zion in the secret doctrine Volume 2, page 21, speak of those who ruled over the descendants produced from the holy stock, and who redescended, who made peace within the fifth race, who taught and instructed it. This very important sentence right there. This phrase, made peace, shows that there has been a previous quarrel, the fate of the Atlanteans in our philosophy, and the, uh, that of the Prediluvians uh, pre in the page 3 Bible, corroborates the idea. Once more, many centuries before the, uh, uh, I know that word, uh, Ptolemies, Ptolemies, the same uh, abuse of the sacred knowledge crept in amongst the initiates of the sanctuary in Egypt. Preserved for countless ages in all their purity, the sacred teachings of the gods, owing to personal ambition and selfishness, became corrupted again. The meaning of the symbols found itself but too often desecrated by unseemly interpretations, and very soon the illusion mysteries remained the only ones pure from adulteration and sacrilegious innovations. These were in honor of Ceres, Dementor, or Nature, and were celebrated in Athens, the flowers of the intellect of Asia Minor and Greece being initiated thereunto. In his fourth book, Z uh, Zom 
Zosimus states that these initiates embrace the whole of mankind. Says Cicero in Dinat Deorum uh, Lib 1. Uh, Amito Illusionium. Alright, let me slow down here. Um, Amito Illusionium Sanctum Ilum et Augustum. Ubi Initiatur Gentes or Orum Ultum. While all right. While well, Aristides calls the mysteries the common temple of the earth. Uh, okay. Uh, it is to preserve some reminiscence of this temple and to rebuild it, if need be, that certain elect ones among the initiated began to be set apart. This was done by their high hierophants in every century, from the time when the sacred allegories first showed uh, showed the first signs of desecration and decay. For the great Illusionia finally shared the same fate as the others. Their earlier excellency and purpose are described by Clement of Alexandria, who shows the greater mysteries divulging the secrets and the mode of construction of the universe, this being the beginning, the end, and the ultimate goal of human knowledge. For in them was shown to be the initiated nature and all things as they are. Strom 8 this is the Pythagorean Gnosis. Epictetus speaks of these instructions in the highest terms. All, and quote, All that is ordained therein was established by our masters for the instruction of men and the correction of our customs. End quote. Apud Arian Desert Lib. Cap. 21. Plato asserts that in the Phaedo the same. The object of the mysteries was to re-establish the soul in its primordial purity or that state of perfection from which it had fallen. Chapter 8 uh, But there came a day when the mysteries deviated from their purity in the same way as the ex exoteric religions. This began when the state bethought itself on the advice of Aristogeaton uh, 510 B.C. of drawing from the Illusionia, Illusionia a constant and prolific source of income. A law was passed to that effect. Henceforth, no one could be initiated without paying a certain sum of money for the privilege. That boon, which could hitherto be acquired only at the price of incessant, almost superhuman effort toward virtue and excellency, was now to be purchased for so much gold. <coughs> Laymen, and even priests themselves, while accepting the desecration, lost eventually their past reverence for the inner mysteries, and this led to further profanation of the sacred science. The rent made in the veil widened with every century. The more than e and more than ever the supreme hierophants, dreading the final publication and distortion of the most holy secrets of nature, labored to eliminate them from the inner program, limiting the full knowledge thereof but to the few. It is those set apart who soon became the only custodians of the divine heirloom of the ages. Seven centuries later we find Apelius, his sincere inclination towards magic and the mystical notwithstanding, writing in his golden age a bitter satire against the hypocrisy and debauchery of certain orders of half-initiated priests. It is through him also that we learn that in his day, 2nd century A.D., the mysteries had become so universal that persons of all ranks and conditions in every country, men, women, and children, were all initiated. Initiation had become as necessary in this day as baptism has since become with the Christians. And as the latter is now, so the former had become then, i.e., meaningless, and a purely dead-letter ceremony of mere form. Still later, the fanatics of the new religion laid their heavy hand on the mysteries. The apate, uh, they who see things as they are, uh, uh, the epite, would be one way, uh, the, the, who see things as they are, disappeared one by one, immigrating into regions inaccessible to the Christians. The mystai, or 
or from mistis or veiled they who seen things only as they appear remained very soon alone sole masters of the situation it is the former that set apart who have preserved the true secrets it is the mystai those who knew them only superficially who laid the first foundation stone of modern masonry and it is from this half pagan half converted primitive fraternity of masons that christian rit ritualism and most of dogmas were born both the epitai and the mystai are entitled to the name of masons for both carrying out their pledges to and the injunction of their long departed hierophants and kings rebuilt the epitae their lower and the mystai their upper temples for such were the irrespective appellations in antiquity and are to this day in certain regions uh, uh, uh speaks in electra act two of the foundations of athens the site of the illusion uh, Lusinian mysteries as being the sacred edifice of the gods i.e. built by the gods initiation was spoken of as walking into the temple and cleaning or rebuilding the temple referred to the body of an initiate on his last and supreme trial uh, vd uh, st. John's gospel 219 the esoteric doc doctrine also was sometimes called by the name of temple and popular ex exoteric religion by that of city to build a temple meant to found an esoteric school to build a city temple signified to establish a public cult therefore the true surviving masons of the lower temple or the crypt the sacred place of initiation are the only custodians, custodians of the true Masonic secrets now lost to the world. We yield willingly to the modern fraternity of Masons the title of Builders of the Higher Temple, as the apparee uh, superiority of the comparative adjective is as illusionary as the blaze of the burning bush of Moses itself in the Templars' lodges. Chapter 9. The misunderstood allegory known as the descent into Hades has wrought infinite mischief. The exoteric fable of Hercules and Theseus, uh, Theseus, Theseus descending into the infernal regions, the journey thither, thither of Orpheus, who found his way by the power of his lyre, Ovid Metam, of Krishna, and finally of Christ, who descended into hell, and the third day rose again from the dead, and was twisted out of recognition by the non-initiated adapters of pagan rites and transformers thereof into church rites and dogmas. Astronomically, this descent into hell symbolized the sun during the autumnal equinox, when abandoning the higher sidereal regions, there was a supposed flight fight between him and the demon of darkness who got the best of our luminary then the sun was imagined to undergo a temporary death and to descend into the infernal regions but mystically it typified the initiatory rites in the crypts of the temple called the underworld bacchus heracles orpheus Asclepius and all the other visitors of the crypt all descended into hell and ascended thence on the third day for all were initiates and builders of the lower temple the words addressed by hermes to prometheus changed on chained on the arid rocks of the Ca uh, caucasus uh, i.e bound by ignorance to his physical body and devoured therefore by the vultures of passion apply to every, every neophyte and every christ Christos on trial to such labors look thou for no termination until the or a God shall appear as a substitute in thy pangs and shall be willing to go both go both to gloomy Hades and to the murky depths around Tartarus uh, that's Esilius Esch 
Prometheus uh, 1027FF. Uh, 1, they mean simply that the pro until Prometheus, or man, could find the god, or Hierophant, the initiator, who would willingly descend into the crypts of initiation and walk around Tartarus with him, the vulture of passion would never cease to gnaw his vitals. The dark region in the crypt into which the candidate under initiation was supposed to throw away forever his worst passions and lusts, hence the allegories by Homer, Ovid, Virgil, etc., all accepted literally by the modern scholar. scholar. Uh, Plegathon was the river in Tartarus into which the initiate was thrice plunged by the Hierophant, after which the trials were over and the new man born anew. He had left in the dark stream the old sinful man forever and issued on the third day from Tartarus what as an individuality, the personality being dead. Such characters as Zion, uh, Tantalus, uh, Sis Sisyphus, etc., are each a personification of some human passion. Uh, Achilles, Achilles, as a pledged initiate, could say no more, but Aristophanes, less pious or more daring, divulges the secret to those who are not blinded by a too strong preconception. Uh, in, this, in his immortal satire on Hercules, Hercules descent into hell. Uh, there we find the chorus of the blessed ones, the initiated, the Elysian fields, the arrival of Bacchus, the god Hierophant, with Heracles, the reception with the lighted torches, emblems of new life and resurrection, from the darkness of human ignorance to the light of spiritual knowledge, eternal life. Every word of the brilliant satire shows the inner meaning of the poet. Wake burning torches, for thou, thou comest, shaking them in thy hand, Lachi, phosphoric star of nightly right. All such final initiations took place during the night. To speak, therefore, of any one as having descended into Hades was equivalent in antiquity to calling him a full initiate. To those who feel inclined to reject this explanation, I would offer a query. Let them explain, in that case, the meaning of a sentence in the sixth book of Virgil's Aeneid. What can a poet mean, if not that which is asserted above? When introducing the aged Anchises in the Elysian fields, he makes him advise Aeneas his son to travel to Italy, where he would have to fight in Latium, a rude and barbarous people. Therefore, he adds, before you venture there, descend into Hades, i.e., get yourself initiated. The benevolent clericals, who are so apt to send us on the slightest provocation to Tartarus, and the infernal regions, do not suspect what good wishes for us the threat contains, and what a holy character one must be before one gets into such a sanctified place. It is not pagans alone who had their mysteries. Bellarum, uh, D. Isabel Triumph, Lib. 2, Cap. 14, states, that the early Christians adopted, after the example of pagan ceremonies, the custom of assembling in a church during the nights preceding their festivals, to hold vigils or wakes. Their ceremonies were performed at first with the most edifying holiness and purity. But, very shortly after that, such immoral abuses crept into these assemblies that the bishops found it necessary to abolish them. We have read in dozens of works about the licentious uh, in the licentiousness in the pagan religious festivals. Cicero is quoted in, D in D Lig Lib 2 Cap 15 showing Diagondas as or Diagondas the Theban, Theban finding no other means of remedying such disorders in the ceremonies than the suppression of the mysteries themselves. 
When we contrast the two kinds of celebrations, however, the pagan mysteries hoary with age centuries before our era, and the Christian agape in the others and others in a religion hardly born and claiming such a purifying influence on its coverts, we can only pity the mental blindness of its defenders and quote for their benefit Ross Common, who asks, When you begin with so much pomp and show, why is the end so little and so low? <laughs> primitive Christianity being derived from the primitive masonry had its grip, passwords, and degrees of initiation. Masonry is an old term, but it came into use very late in our era. Paul calls himself a master builder, and he was one. The ancient Masons called themselves by various names, and most of the Alexandrian ecclesiastics, uh, eclectics, sorry, Adrian, Alexandrian eclectics, the Theosophists of Ammonius, Saccas, and the later Neoplatonists are, were all virtually Masons. They were all bound by oaths to secrecy, considered themselves a brotherhood, and had also their signs of recognition. The eclectics, or the philanthians, compri comprised within their ranks the ablest and most learned scholars of the day, as also several crowned heads, says the author of the eclectic philosophy. Their doctrines were adopted by pagans and Christians in Asia and Europe, and for a season everything seemed favorable for the general fusion of religious belief. The emperors Alexander, Severus, and Julian embraced them. Their predominating influence upon religious ideas excited the jealousy of the Christians of Alexandria. The school was removed to Athens and finally closed by the emperor Justinian. Justin, Justinian. Its professors withdrew to Persia and, we may add, beyond to India and Central Asia, for we find their influence everywhere in Asiatic countries where they made many disciples. A few more details may prove perchance interesting. We know that the Eleusian, Eleusian mysteries survived all others, while the secret cults of the minor gods such as Curates and Dactyl, Dactyli, uh, the worship of Adonis of, and of uh, Kabiri, and even those of old Egypt that had entirely disappeared under the revengeful and cruel hand of the pitless Theodosius, uh, the murder of the Thessalonians who were butchered by this uh, pious son of the church. <laughs> the mysteries of Eleusis uh, could not be so easily disposed of. They were indeed the religion of mankind, and shone in all their ancient splendor, if not in their prim primitive purity. It took several centuries to abolish them, and they could not be entirely suppressed before the year 396 of our era. It is then that the bu builders of the higher or city temple appeared first on the scene and worked unrelentingly to infuse their rituals and peculiar dogmas into the nascent and ever-fighting and quarreling church. The triple sanctus of the Roman Catholic Mass is the triple SSS of these early Masons. This and it is the modern prefix to their documents or any written balustra. Uh, the initial of uh, salutum, or health, as cunningly put by a mason. This triple Masonic uh, salutation is the most ancient among their greetings. SSS 666 is also is the main, uh, the triple Masonic salutation, as they call it, uh, is representative of health, as they say, or salutium, or salutum. Uh, is is uh, triple helix, folks. Let me just get to the point. Triple sanctus, triple helix DNA. Okay. So, moving on. Uh, s uh, chapter 11. But they did not limit their graphs on the tree of the Christian religion to this alone. During the mysteries of Eleusis, wine represented Bacchus and Ceres. Uh, wine and bread or corn Bacchus is certainly of Indian origin. Uh, Pausanias shows him 
the first to lead an expedition against India, and the first to throw a bridge over the Euphrates, the cable, quote, and the cable which served to unite the two opposite shores being exhibited to this day, okay, writes this historian, it being woven from the vine branches and trailings of ivy. Uh, Arianus and Quintus Curtius explain the allegory of Bacchus' birth from the thigh of Zeus by saying that he was born on the Indian Mount Meru from thigh or on high. <laughs> we are aware that uh, Eurasthenes uh, and Strabo believed the Indian Bacchus had been invented by flatterers to simply please Alexander believed to have conquered India as Bacchus is supposed to have done. But on the other hand, Cicero mentions the god as the son of Dion and Nisus, the Dionysus, or means of god dis from Mount Nice in India. Dionysus. God from Mount Dis Mount, Mount Nice. Bacchus crowned with ivy or Kissos or Krishna. One of those names was Kissin. Uh, Dionysus uh, was preeminently the god who, or Diana, Dionysus, some people call it Dionysus, uh, preeminently the god who was expected to liberate the souls of men from their prisons of flesh. Hades and the human Tartarus in, in one of his symbolical senses. Cicero calls Orpheus a son of Bacchus. And there is a tradition which not only makes Orpheus come from India, he being called dark of tawny complexion, but identifies him with Arjuna, the Chela, and adoptive son of Krishna. Vidi, five years of theosophy, was writing known before Panini. Now Ceres, or Dementor, was the female productive principle of the earth the spouse of Father Aether, or Zeus, and Bacchus, the son of Zeus, Jupiter, was his father manifested. In other words, Ceres and Bacchus were the personifications of substance and spirit, the two vivifying principles in nature and on earth. The Hierophant initiator presented symbolically before the final revelation of the mysteries wine and bread to the candidate, who ate and drank, in token that the spirit was to quicken matter i.e. the divine wisdom of the higher self was to enter into and take possession of his inner self or soul through what was to be revealed to him. This rite was adopted by the Christian church. The Hierophant was called the Father, as now passed part and, pass parcel, part and parcel minus knowledge into the Father Priest, who today administers the same communion, Jesus calls himself a vine, and his father, the husbandman, and his injunction at the Last Supper shows his thorough knowledge of the symbolical meaning, vidi infra note, of bread and wine, and his identification with the logoi of the ancients, whose eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood have eternal life. This is a hard saying, he adds, the words remata, or arcane utterances, that I, or Rima, as, as is called by some people, uh, that I speak unto you, they are the Spirit and they are life. They are because it is in the Spirit that quicketh, quickeneth. Furthermore, these Ramada of Jesus are indeed the arcane utterance of an initiate. And yes, Jesus was initiate. He was initiate. He spent many years studying. Uh, those are the missing years. That's where he went. Uh, but anyway, I'm not talking about that right now. We're reading a book, right? Yeah, that's it. But between this noble rite as old as symbolism and its later anthropomorphic interpretation, uh, now known as transubstantiation, there is an abyss of ecclesi ecclesiastical f sophistry with what force the exclamation, Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge, and will not permit even now gnosis to be given to others. With what tenfold force I say it applies more now than then. 
I that gnosis ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were and are entering ye prevented, and still prevent. Nor has the modern priesthood alone laid itself open to this blame. Masons, the descendants, or at any rate the successors, of the builders of the upper temple, during the mysteries, they who ought to know better will <laughs> will poo poo or poo poo that actually what it says huh? poo poo and scorn that's all these big words and then he throws in some silly stuff like that this guy is hilarious anyway will poo poo and scorn anyone among their own brethren who will remind them of their true origin uh several great modern scholars and Kabbalists who are masons and could be named received worse than cold shoulder from their brethren it is never the same old story. Even Ragon, the most learned in his day among all the Masons of our century, complains of it in these words. All the ancient narratives attest that the initiations in the days of old had an imposing ceremonial and became a memorable forever through the grand truths divulged and the knowledge that resulted therefrom. And yet there are some modern masons of half-learning who hasten to treat as charlatans all those who successfully remind of and explain to them these ancient ceremonies. And that's from uh, the Course, Philos, uh, Course Philosophies, uh, page 87, note number 2. Uh, okay, chapter 12. Venetus Venetatum, uh, nothing is new under the sun. Nothing is new under the sun. The litanies of the Virgin Mary prove it in the sincerest way. Pope Gregory first introduces the worship of the Virgin Mary, and the Chalcedon Chalcedonian Council proclaim her the Mother of God. But the author of the litanies had not even the decency, or is it the brains, to furnish her with any other than pagan adjectives and titles, as I shall presently show. Not a simmer, Sorry, not a symbol, not a metaphor of this famous litany, but belong to a crowd of goddesses, all queens, virgins, or mothers. These three titles applying to Isis, Rhea, Cybele, Diana, Lucifera, Lucina, Luna, Tellus, Latona, Triformis, uh, Prosperpina, Hecate, Juno, Vesta, Ceres, Ceres, uh, Leucothea, Astarte, uh, Celestial Venus, yes, and Urania, and Alma Venus, etc. All the same goddess. What goddess says, goddess. Um, besides the primitive uh, signification of Trinity, the esoteric or, or that father, mother, son, does not this Western Trinity three faces mean in the Masonic pantheon? Moon, I mean, sorry, sun, moon, and the venerable. The slight alteration, forsooth, from the Germanic and northern fire, sun, and moon. It is the initiate or intimate knowledge of this perchance that made the Mason J. M. Ragon describe his profession of faith thus For me, the sun is the same as Horus, son of Osiris and Isis. He is the sun, and see how they spell that from that, sun who every year redeems the world from sterility and the universal death of the races. And as he goes on to speak of the Virgin Mary's particular litanies, temples, festivals, masses, and church services, pilgrimages, oratories, Jacobins, Franciscans, vestals, prodigies, Ex voto, niches, statues, etc., etc., etc. D. Malvel, a great Hebrew scholar and translator of the rabbinic, rabbit, <laughs> rabbinical literature, uh, observes that the Jews give to the moon all those names which, in the litanies, are used to glorify the Virgin. He finds in the litanies of Jesus all the attributes of Osiris, the eternal son, and of Horus, the annual son. And he proves it. Mater Christi is the mother of the Redeemer of the old Masons, who is the son. The Holy Poli 
among the Egyptians uh, claimed that the child, symbol of the great central star Horus, was the son of Osiris and Osith, whose souls had ensouled after their death the sun and the moon. Isis became, with the Phoenicians, Astarte, the name under which they adored the moon, personified as a woman adorned with horns, which symbolizes the crescent. Astarte was represented at the autumnal equinox after her husband's, the sun's, defeat by the Prince of Darkness, then descent into Hades. As weeping over the loss of her consort, who is also her son, as Isis does, that of her consort, brother and son, Horus, or, or Isis, Osiris and Horus, Astarte holds in her hand a cruciform stick, a regular cross, and stands weeping on the crescent moon. Or some has her holding the moon above her head, too. Uh, the crescent above her head. Um... <clears throat> the Christian Virgin Mary is often represented in the same way, standing on the new moon, surrounded by stars, weeping for her son, juxta crucem lacrimosa dum pendabat filius. I should work on my Latin, huh? But I got it right, I'm just not very fluent. Anyway, si stabit mater dolorius, dolorosa, um, is not she the hear Heres, heiress of Isis and Astarte, asked the author. Truly, you have but to repeat the litany to the Virgin of the Roman Catholic Church, to find yourself repeating ancient incantations to Adonai, or Venus, the mother of Adonis, the solar god of so many nations, to Mileta, the Assyrian Venus, goddess of nature, to Eliot, whom the Arabs symbolized by the two lunar horns, to Selene, wife and sister of Helios, uh, the sun, you know, god of the Greeks, or to Magna Mater, uh, Honestimia Parisma, Castima, the universal mother of all beings, because she is mother nature. Verily is Maria, Mary, the Isis, Marianamos, the goddess mother of the ten thousand names. As the sun was Phobius, or Phobus, uh, in the heaven, and he so became Apollo on earth, and Pluto in the still lower regions. After sunset, uh, in the lower regions, after sunset, sorry, and so the moon was Phoebe, or Phoebe, uh, in heaven, and Diana on earth, and Gaia, Latona, Ceres, same thing, becoming Hecate, or Hect Hecate, I never can pronounce that one, and Proserpine in Hades. Where is the wonder then if Mary is called Regina Virginium, Queen of Virgins? Uh, the Casti Castissima, most chaste, and uh, when even the prayer, when even the prayers offered to her at the sixth hour of the morning in the evening are copied from those sung by the heathen Gentiles at the same hours in honor of Phoebe and Hecate. 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 <laughs> I never can pronounce that. Okay, sorry, folks. Now I just keep moving. Uh, the verse of the litany to the Virgin Stella Matu Matutina the morning star or lucifer the name which jesus calls himself in Res revelations 22:16 and which becomes nevertheless the name of the devil as soon as theosophical journal assumes it we are informed is a faithful copy of a verse from the litany of the triformis of the pagans it is at the council which condemned nestorius that mary was first titled as the mother of god mater d uh, in our next, we shall have something to say about this famous litany of the Virgin and show its origin in full. We shall call our proofs as we go along from the classics and the moderns and supplement the whole from the annuals of religions as found in the esoteric doctrine. 
Meanwhile, we may add a few more statements and give etymology of the most sacred terms in ecclesiastical rit ritualism. Okay, so it's chapter 13. Let us give a few moments of attention to the assemblies of the builders of the upper temple in early Christianity. Regon sh was shown plainly to uh, us the origin of the following terms. A. The word mass comes from the Latin messis, harvest, whence the noun messias, he who ripens the harvest, Christ the Son. B. The word lodge, used by Masons, the feeble successors of the initiates, has its root in loga, or loka in Sanskrit, its uh, locality and in a world, and in the Greek logos, uh, the word a discourse signifying in its full meaning a place where certain things are discussed. And C. These assemblies of the Logos of the primitive initiated Masons came to be called the Synoxis, or gatherings of the brethren, for the purpose of praying and celebrating the Konya Supper, uh, wherein the blood bloodless offerings, fruits, and cereals were used. Uh, soon after, these offerings began to be called Hostai, or sacred and pure hosties. Uh, in contrast to the impure sacrifices as prisoners of war, hostess, whence the word hostage. Um, as the offerings consisted of the harvest fruits, the first fruits of messes, thence the word mass, since no father of the church mentions, as some scholars would have it, that the word mass comes from the Hebrew missa, oblatum offering, one explanation is as good as the other. For an exhaustive inquiry on the word Missa or Mi and Mizda, see King's Gnostics, uh, page 124. Um, now the word Synaxis, Synaxis was also called by the Greeks Agirmos, agir, uh, a collection of men assembly. Agirmos. Agirmos. Um, it referred to initiation into the mysteries. Um, both words, Synasis and Agrimos, uh, Hitchis gives the name Agrimos to the first day of initiation into the mystery of Ceres, or Ceres, uh, goddess of the harvest, and refers to it also under that of Synaxis. The early Christians called their masses, before this term was adopted, and the celebration of their mysteries, Synaxis, a word compounded from sun with and ago, I lead. Whence the Greek synaxis, or an assembly, became obsolete with the Christians, and the word missa, or mass, prevailed and remained. Theolog theologians will have it, desirous as they are to veil its etymology, that the term mess messias, or messiah, is derived from the Latin word missus, or messenger, the sent, the sent one. But if so, then again it may be applied as well to the sun the annual messenger sent to bring light and new life to earth and its products the hebrew word for messiah masha anointed from masha to anoint will hardly apply to or bear out the identity in the ecclesiastical sense nor will the latin missa mass derive well from the other latin word mitir or missum to sin or dismiss. Because the communion service, its heart and soul, is based on the consecration and oblation of the host or hostia, sacrifice, a wafer, a thin leaf-like bread, representing the body of Christ in the Eucharist, and such wafer of flour is a direct development of the harvest <laughs> or cereal offerings. Again, the primitive masses were conus, late di di diners or suppers, late diners or suppers, which from the simple meals of Romans who washed and were anointed and wore a senatory garment at dinner became consecrated meals in memory of the Last Supper of Christ. The converted Jews in the days of the apostles met their synaxis to read the evangels and their correspondence epistles. St. Justin, 150 A.D., tells us that these solemn assemblies were held on the day called Sun 
Sunday dies Magnus, on which days there were psalms chanted, collation of baptism with pure water, and the agape of the holy colonna with bread and wine. Uh, what was this hybrid combination of pagan Roman dinners raised by the inventors of church dogmas to a sacred mystery to do with the Hebrew Messiah? Who causes to go down into the pit, or Hades, or its Greek transliteration, Messias? As shown by Nork, Jesus was never anointed neither as a high priest or king. Therefore, his name of Messias cannot be derived from its present Hebrew equivalent. The less so, since the word anointed or rubbed with oil, a homeric firm, homeric firm, sorry, is kreis or creo, both to anoint the body with oil. See Lucifer for November 1887, es es esoteric character of the Gospels. Um, another high mason, the author of the Source of Measures, summarizes this embrologo, uh, embroglio of the ages in a new in a few lines by saying the fact is there were two messiahs one as causing himself to go down into the pit for the salvation of the world from times immemorial immemorial every initiate before entering on his supreme trial of initiation in antiquity at the present time pronounced these sacramental words and I swear to give up my life for the salvation of my brothers which constitute the whole of mankind if called upon and to die in the defense of truth. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. Alright, this was the sun shorn of his golden rays and crowned with the blackened one symbolizing this loss as the thorns, the crown of thorns. The other was the triumphant Messiah mounted up to his summit of the arch of heaven, perso personated as the lion of the tribe of Judah. In both instances, he had the cross. At the Embarvales, Embarvales the festivals in honor of Sears, uh, mm, damn, excuse me again. The Arval, the assistant of the high priest, clad in pure white, placing the hostia, the sacrificial heap, or, uh, you know, the sacrifice of a cake of corn, water, and wine, tasted the wine of libation, and gave to all others to taste. The oblation, or offering, was then taken up by the high priest. It symbolized the three kingdoms of nature, the cake of corn, vegetable kingdom, the sacrificial vase, or chalice, the mineral oil, and the pow or the scarf-like garment of the Hierophant, and uh, an end of which he threw over the oblation wine cup. You know, when they, in church, in the Roman churches, when they, and then they throws the, his little scarf thing up over it. That's what they're talking about. And this Paul was made by pure white lambskins. Okay. Um, the modern priest repeats this gesture for gesture and acts of the a pagan priest. See? In, in the Catholic Church. That's what I just pointed out. I guess I just could, could have kept reading, huh? <laughs> he lifts up and offers the bread <coughs> to be consecrated, blesses the water that is to be put in the chalice, and then pours the wine into it, incenses the altar, etc., etc., and going to the altar, washes its fingers, saying, I will wash my hands among the innocent and encompass thy altar, O Lord. He does so because the ancient and pagan priests did the same, saying, I wash with lustral water my hand amongst the in innocent, the fully initiated brethren, that's who the innocent are, so, you know, in this uh, reference, and encompasses thy altar, O great goddess, Ceres. Thrice went the high priest round the altar loaded with offerings, carrying high above his head the chalice covered with the end of his snow-white lambskin. The consecrated vestment worn by the Pope, the Paul, has the form of a scarf made of white wool, embroidered with purple crosses, purple crosses, Phoenician, purple. In the Greek church, the priest covers in the end of the pall, thrown over his shoulder, the chalice. The high priest of antiquity repeated thrice during the divine services the O Redemptor Mundi, the Apollo, to Apollo, the Son, and his Matar Salvatoris to Ceres, the earth, his Virgo, Virgo per, Peritura, 
to the virgin goddesses, etc., and pronounce seven tenary commemorations. Hearken, O Masons. The tenary number, ternary number, so reverenced in antiquity, is as reverenced now, and is produced five times during the mass. Pronounced five times during the mass. We have three introbial, three Kiri Elysium, three Mikulpa, and three Agnus Dei, three Domus Dominus Vobiscum, a true Masonic series. Let us add to this the three Et Cum Spirituo, and the Christian Mass yields to us the same seven triple commemorations. <coughs> Paganism, Masonry, and Theology such as the historical trinity now ruling the world. Sub Rosa. <laughs> Shall we close with the Masonic greeting and say, Illustrious officers of Hiram Abiff, initiates and wi widow's sons, the kingdom of darkness and ignorance is fast dispelling, but there are regions still untouched by the hand of the scholar. And as black as the night of Egypt, frater sobri estote es vigilante. And forever be vigilant, fraternal brothers. And that's the end. That's the end of that reading. Wow, that was actually faster than I thought it would be. So, with that, um, man, I could just tear off into this, and I could spend a whole another hour going through this whole thing uh, with my uh, own personal discoveries. However, I'm not going to do that, because that's not the purpose of this. Uh, I do thank you for joining me. I hope you gained, gleaned some some good information and maybe tied some loose ends for yourselves uh, through this uh, this here latest reading. And uh, please join me for the next one. I'll have a good night.